Today we'll be looking at Malachi chapter 2. And this is a split chapter. At the beginning of the chapter, he's still addressing the issue of the problem with the priests. The second half of the chapter, however, it's sort of a mixed bag. Yes, he's directly addressing the issue of divorce, but he's also veiledly addressing the issue of them leaving their faith. So we'll get to that in just a bit. Let's begin with the first verse. And now, O priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you did not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on their faces, the refuse of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and the people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts, but you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. This is a problem that didn't just exist at this time. We had the problem of the partiality being shown all the way back with Eli's sons. And it was partiality to those that were showing them favor. And they would go ahead and make a mockery of the worship of God because when people would come to make sacrifice, they would bully the people as far as the sacrifice and take what they wanted as opposed to taking the priest's portion. And because they were not following God's laws, they were making a mockery of God's law before the people who were coming to worship God. They were essentially saying, what God has said doesn't matter. We're going to do it our way. And unfortunately, that kind of mentality can still exist today. When God is not viewed as an authority relative to what he's requested, instead, sometimes people view it as, well, that was the way they did it back then. That's just sort of an advised way of doing it. If your wife told you, or your house husband, your spouse, told you their favorite food was steak, and what you brought home after being told that was chicken, you didn't do what they asked, or you didn't do what you knew would please them. That's a problem. It's showing no respect for them if you've taken the time to ask to find out what it is that's important to them, and then you totally disregard it. That's exactly what the priests were doing, except to make it worse, they were the ones who knew the law because they were the ones responsible for communicating it to the people. So in that respect, they made it all the worse. And keep that thought in mind as we go on with the next section, because, yes, <clears throat> excuse me, he's directly talking about divorce, but he's also talking about separating oneself from their initial faith. Beginning with verse 10. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. 
He has married the daughter of a foreign god. Okay, I'm going to stop there because, okay, we get the idea that a nation isn't marrying a real god. In this respect, as I said, he's using marriage both as a direct physical relationship of husband and wife, but he's also using it relative to faith. Judah should have been a people of God, and instead they were uniting themselves with foreign gods. Continuing on, verse 12, May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Meaning, they know exactly what they're doing. They're going after the foreign god, and then they're turning around and bringing to God whatever is convenient to them at the time. As though it's acceptable to be worshiping the foreign god and God at the same time. It's sort of like having your spouse and having your lover and then not be the same person. It's sick and it's wrong, whether we're talking about it spiritually or we're talking about it in a human relationship of marriage. 13. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, that you do not deal treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, In what way have we wearied him? And that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? They were making a mockery of God at the same time they were dealing treacherously with God because they were cozying up to foreign gods. And when it talks about the garments being covered in violence, in the case of Moloch, they were sacrificing their children to the God, newborn infants. So it wasn't just a, uh, what's the word called? When you try, it's not a metaphor, it's not a simile. Anyway, it's a word that creates imagery. It's not just a word that's trying to create imagery. When he says violence relative to the spiritual unfaithfulness that's occurring, he actually did mean violence in this instance. Now, Here's another thing that parallels both the human relationship and the relationship between God, Israel, and the foreign gods. There were two types of divorce that existed in the Old Testament. There is the written certificate of divorce, where essentially what happens is when a person is divorced, the marriage is ended. Then there was the second type of divorce, and we see this occurring with David and and the daughter of Saul. It's a separation, a separation that pretty much meant everything that was due ceases, but legally the marriage hasn't stopped. So Saul's daughter was still one of David's wife, wives, even though he separated from her from that point forward. That would be considered a type of divorce. It's a separation, but in that instance, that separation wasn't coupled with an actual separation of marriage or an ending of marriage. Here's the problem with that. If the husband separated from his wife without giving her the writ of divorce, 
She had no recourse other than to be still dependent upon the husband who no longer was supportive of her. Essentially, she could starve to death if she didn't have the means herself to support herself while her husband had declared himself to be separate but still married. In a sense, a very violent act, life-threatening for the, for the wife. And it says right there in verse 16, he hates divorce, meaning God hates divorce. And it's both types. You can't play around with the idea of, oh, well, I'm not legally divorced. No, you have an obligation to God, to your spouse, as to how you are treating them daily. If you're not treating them the right way relative to the commitment you made in the beginning, then you're not doing what you said you vowed to do before God and man. And for me, this comes up at an interesting time. Uh, just this past week, I performed the wedding ceremony for Matthew and his wife. And I did it serious all the way up to the point where I read the part in Genesis where for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and put my hand on Matthew's shoulder. And I said, this is God telling you, you're not getting any more money from home. Joking aside, though, it's a commitment. A commitment made not just between husband and wife. It's also a commitment to God. A commitment about a relationship that is supposed to be permanent. Committing to that relationship is just as serious as our commitment to God. We're not to let anything come before it. God is supreme. We should be putting him first. And the second one we put first is our spouse. Unfortunately, both with the foreign gods and also the second, third, fourth wives, how many ever, that were taken, that were oftentimes related to these false gods. It was a destruction of what God intended to be good and to be pure. It wasn't just a destruction because marriage was getting messed over. It was also a destruction because spiritually, when they were marrying themselves to people who believed differently, who did not believe in the God of Israel, they were corrupting not only themselves, but their children. Because the children that were being raised in that household were being influenced by one who did not believe in God. So it wasn't just the marriage that was unpure. It was the children that were being made unpure because they were being taught the beliefs and witnessed to the practices of the false gods. I pray that you keep in God's word. I'm also praying you keep healthy.